Hi, this is Rachel, and this is topic 26 of our supervision curriculum. We're going to be talking about transitioning or exiting services. So when you take on a client, you want to make sure that you are practicing within your scope of competence, but ending services or transitioning someone out of services also plays into that fact and is an ethical consideration that we need to take into account before we even start accepting clients. So how you end or transition the services is equally as important as making the decision to start the services. There is guidance from the BACB about why services might be discontinued, and all of those reasons should be spelled out in the initial contract for services. So from the Professional and Ethical Compliance Code for Behavior Analysts, which technically is now old and not included, but some of you may be a little bit more familiar with this. It gave reasons for interrupting or discontinuing services and also gave reasons for discontinuing specific programs. The ethics code for behavior analysts, which is the new one, does the same, but kind of breaks it down in a slightly different way. So that's what we're going to be focusing on. So uh, 3.15 of the Ethics Code for Behavior Analysts talks about appropriately discontinuing services. Um, it also references some other uh, codes. Um, basically, they identified six different reasons that are ethical reasons for discontinuing services. So first, the client has met all the behavior change goals. That's wonderful. And this hopefully is the reason that someone is leaving uh, services because they do not need supports anymore. But what that tells us too, when we start talking about accepting clients is we need to identify what those behavior change goals are in the start so that we can then go back and measure, have they met them? And then we know when to discontinue those services. Two, the client is not benefiting from service. So this is super important. And in the old one, it said um, the other, uh, it had another reason or the client is being harmed. Both of these really fall into here. Either the client is not benefit from, benefiting from the service, but at worst, we are harming the individual. And that's a possibility. And we don't want to be harming the individual. We don't want our individual to not be benefiting from the service. So we need to be taking data, looking at our programming, looking at our outcomes, looking at the progress that the individual is making to determine whether or not our client is benefiting from service. And then we need to be realistic about do we have the competence to do something differently that could support this individual? Or do we need to exit and transition the services because this is actually outside of our scope of competence? Number three, the behavior analyst and or their supervisees or trainees are exposed to potentially harmful conditions that cannot be reasonably resolved. And that makes sense. We don't want to put anybody in danger, to put anybody into a potential, um, un, not just uncomfortable, but unsafe environment. And there's another code where they sort of address how do we go about mitigating these potentially harmful conditions? How can we reasonably resolve them? So we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail, but this is the one that is there to protect the behavior analysts and the service providers that if this is an unsafe environment, then that is reasonable to transition someone out. Again, we want to look at what are the potentially harmful conditions and can they be reasonably reasonably resolved? Do we have the competence to fix these issues? Is it within our control to um, uh, change the environment? If so, we should be doing that. If not, then yes, we should not put anybody at harm and we should transition services. Number four, 
the client and or the relevant stakeholder request discontinuation of services. If they don't want us anymore, they don't want services anymore, that's fine. That is perfectly reasonable to then transition and exit services. You can't force somebody to take your services. Um, if they're not finding a benefit, if they don't want them, um, maybe they are uh, moving and they're not going to even be in that physical location, or they just don't want them anymore, um, then we discontinue. Uh, we do not fight somebody to receive our services. Um, we honor their requests and we work to transition them and, and provide them with everything they might need for any supports that they might be switching to. Number five, the relevant stakeholders are not complying with the behavior change intervention despite appropriate efforts to address barriers. Now, I understand where this is coming from and it is in our ethics code. So we are going to follow it. However, I think that the emphasis should be on us adapting to what our relevant stakeholders need. If we are creating behavior change plans that the individual doesn't want to follow, the caregivers don't want to follow, then what are we doing, right? We shouldn't be making things that somebody doesn't want to follow or they can't follow because we haven't provided enough support or training. And then we're going to kick them out because they're not doing what they didn't want to do in the first place, right? Like that is not the way this should be spun. <laughs> we should instead be finding out, you know, why something's not working and making changes to meet the needs of the stakeholders, meet the needs of the individual, meet the needs of that environment in the way that we are helping them to make behavior change. So addressing the barriers might be us changing the way that we are presenting something so that it makes more sense and so that it works better for another person to implement. Um, also, if we are talking about relevant stakeholders not complying, right, that whole not complying thing, just I think that's what bugs me. Um, we need to look at why, right? What is it that makes it difficult for them to change their behavior? Um, is it a motivation thing? In which case they don't like what we've programmed. Can we come up with something else? Is it a skill deficit? In which case can we provide more training and more support to make this easier for somebody to do? What can we do to implement? Remember, if our learner's behavior isn't changing, that's on us. We're part of that environment. What can we do? Now, in reality, there might be factors that are just beyond our control. We've attempted to adapt everything in every possible way, and we are not able to meet the needs of the environment. What I suspect would be happening and what I have seen in those situations is that you will also see that your client is not benefiting from that service anymore. And that can be the signal that this is not going to work. If we have to, if we try to adapt things um, to fit the environment, but they no longer help the client, the client is our focus. If the client is not benefiting, then that's why we transition services. Um, it's not about, this number five here is not about, it's my way or the highway, do it the way I say, or I'm kicking you out of services. I don't believe that is the intent behind this, especially if you go back and you look at the uh, principles and guidelines that our ethics code is built off of. But instead, I think that if you are taking data and you are attempting to address those barriers, but there are aspects that you are not able to address such that the learner is not benefiting 
from the service, then that is when you need to transition and exit the services. And then number six, if services are no longer funded, I understand again, people have to get paid and this is a systems issue where we wanna make sure that individuals can have the funding for the services that they need. I would say that if services are no longer funded, then probably your client or stakeholders are going to discontinue because they are not able to pay for it um, on their own. So that is where that transition would come in because the client is declining the services because they are no longer able to pay if the funding stream disappears. Um, so I think that some of these uh, extras in this version spell things out a little bit differently. Um, I think that some of these are still encompassed in the original ones, but these are the six. These are the six ethical reasons that you can transition or discontinue services and other reasons are not ethical reasons. So you should look for um, what you can be doing to fix those things. All right, now some other ones that are related to um, discontinuing, when we talk about discontinuing services, we might be talking about discontinuing specific programs. Um, 2.15 talks about minimizing the risk of behavior change interventions that you select. Um, our goal is minimizing risk of harm. Um, and we would only recommend restrictive or punishment procedures only after demonstrating that the desired results have not been obtained using less intrusive means or when determined by the team, the risks outweigh um, uh, or the risk of harm outweighs the risk of the program. Now, personal experience, um, I have yet to interact with an individual where we could not find something that worked prior to a punishment procedure. So we did not use punishment procedures because we always found something to work. And I have worked with individuals with severe aggression, individuals with severe self-injury, individuals with um, severe property destruction, okay? I haven't worked with every possible version of that or every possible individual, but I'm going to challenge people to try harder before looking at punishment strategies. However, the reason I bring this up in this topic and not in our ethics topic, because it will come up again in our ethics topic, um, is that you should be taking data and continually evaluating. It says here, last line, behavior analysts must continually evaluate and document the effectiveness of restrictive or punish ba punishment-based procedures and modify or discontinue the behavior change intervention in a timely manner if it is ineffective. So another reason that you might discontinue a specific program is if it is ineffective. So we need to be looking at anything we put in. So this should apply to our all of our treatment plans, but we should be looking at all of them with a fine tooth comb to determine if they are effective or ineffective. And if it is ineffective, don't sit there and keep trying it in hopes that, well, maybe it'll improve, right? And I think this also reflects if you've got a, a skill acquisition program in there and no change has happened. The data has been the same for two, three weeks. Move on, change something, figure out why it's not working because just sitting there not changing behavior means it's ineffective, means that it's not working. So we need to be analyzing our data constantly and we need to be changing it if it's not working. It's not up to us to sit there and wait for it to work for the learner. If it works, it's going to work and it should work quickly. If it's not changing quickly, then it's not working. And we need to come back 
and change what we are doing. We need to discontinue that program or we need transition to something else so that we are helping our learner at every moment, not sitting in a maintenance mode, not sitting in, in uh waiting for something to change that we don't know what that might be, um, and certainly not using ineffective um, interventions that could harm an individual um, or, or even just waste their time, right? All right, and then the next one here is 2.19, and it talks about addressing conditions that interfere with service delivery. So, Behavior analysts um, actively identify and address environmental conditions that may interfere with or prevent service delivery. So here, although we said, look, if we've tried everything, we could discontinue it. Here's where it spells out, what does try everything look like, right? So what does that mean? Um, in such situations, behavior analysts remove or minimize the conditions uh, identify effective modifications to the intervention and or consider obtaining and recommending assistance from other professionals. So this is where we need to adjust what it is that we're doing. If service delivery is not happening, if somebody is not quote unquote complying with our behavior change plan, what does that mean for us? That means we need to look at changing that plan. <laughs> we need to look at minimizing what are the uh, conditions that are interfering with their ability to implement this. We need to um, modify the intervention so that it can be effective. Um, we need to consult with other people. Um, we need to maybe refer this individual out for additional supports or different supports than what we are able to offer and then work in conjunction with that person in order to do that. Um, and then we document what we did and how it worked. And in this way, the overall of this is that if you are taking data on everything that you're doing and you are trying your best, to meet the needs of the individual and meet the needs of those supporting the individual, then your data should reflect whether it's working. And if it's not working, it's on us to change it. So some other things when we talk about transitioning and exiting services, um, you should make sure that any contract you, anytime you accept a client, you sign a contract. And that contract, it doesn't even have to be for an exchange of money if you're just volunteering your time, but it should spell out the conditions under which you are providing the services and why you might discontinue those services. Um, you should always make sure that any contracts are reviewed by appropriate experts, maybe HR, maybe legal. Um, there are some samples that are available um, online. I know specifically members of the Association of Professional Behavior Analysts, um, members get access to a sample contract form that has gone through some review. Um, there are other uh, service providers that help write contracts and can just buy ABA contracts as well. And then you individualize it, right? Um, in your contracts, you should include your transition plan and your goals for the service and your discontinuation plan or discharge criteria. So the type of service that you're offering may change the timeline. Um, but you should have all of these things spelled out in the beginning and then get the consenting party um, signature on that so that you guys are all on the same page about what it is that is expected. So here's some sample language for discharge criteria. Uh, data on goals will be collected each session. Progress towards goals will be reviewed monthly and changes to interventions will be made as needed according to the data. A comprehensive assessment of skills will be completed every six months. When assessments show performance equal to neurotypical peers, the ABA services will end. Um, it's difficult to predict how quickly an individual will learn considering the learner's age and severity of skill deficits. I would estimate at least 
and you fill in the blank, more years of service or more months of service before discharge would occur. So this is a sample. It could be different than that. You know, go with uh, what you're able to find. But this is an example of what discharge criteria might look like. Um, transition plan. Here's an example. Prior to transition, all interested parents, caregivers, and other professional providers will be trained on ABA principles to promote generalization of skills from the ABA teaching environment to natural settings. Once transition begins, direct services will be reduced gradually before eliminating services completely. So this is sort of that like fade out model. Um, progress will continue to be monitored for one month after direct services end. And if a learner regresses during the transition period, services will be reinstated and faded out more gradually. Again, this is an example. This wouldn't necessarily be the appropriate transition plan for every situation, but this is an example of what some of that language might look like. All right, so for our assignment, identify three reasons for a client deciding to end services. Now, this isn't something that's spelled out, but think about it. Why might a client not want your services anymore? All right, then identify five reasons for a provider ending the services. Now, up in the ethics code, you'll see there are six, but one of them was the client declined services. So that's not it. All right, what are the other five ethical reasons for discontinuing services. Then draft a contract or get one of those samples and start modifying it for beginning and ending services. Now it doesn't need to include for the purposes of this assignment, it doesn't need to include everything that should be in a contract, but spell out what might be the goals, what might be the conditions under which you would discontinue services with this individual, and what might a transition plan look like. Um, and then outline that sample transition plan. What would be the steps for fading out for an individual? You could include that as part of the contract, or you could have it as a separate piece. So um, if you want to, you can ask questions or provide your answers to those um, assignments in the comment box. I'm happy to provide feedback or answer any questions. And if you like this series, please subscribe so that you get notified when we publish the next one. So thank you so much.